Jordan Dunning. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you for having me on, Elliot. Hey, the pleasure is mine. I'm looking forward to diving into your story and all the exciting things you've got going on at this moment in time. But before we do, can you give the listeners a bit of context about who you are and what it is that you do? Sure. So I'm Jordan. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Hatchpath, which is a marketplace connecting clients with health coaches. And the reason I did it, I'm sure we'll get into a bit more of my story, but I had some health issues that I had to overcome. And I tried a lot of the traditional Western medicine ways. And um, I was just getting completely worse and worse. And it wasn't until I found someone that was my coach that fully understood me and, and stood with me for the whole journey that I started to get better. And with eight month, within eight months, I was cured. I became a, a health coach myself. And I realized that, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of other people doing this. And I want to be able to create a trusted way to connect people and help them on their health journey, no matter what it is. Yeah, I love that the mission always comes from someone who has gone through the experience themselves. I think they are the best people to be practitioners and also promoters of something along these lines. So I think that, that ties in nicely. And I want to get into the depths of what health issues you went through. So Lyme disease was an enormous, enormous part of your life for some time. And I don't know a huge amount about it. You know, the only thing that generally most of us hear is kind of the celebrities talking about it, like Justin Bieber or Avril Lavigne and go through their stories. But no one really has too much of an understanding when I speak to someone on a general level of what it looks like. So can you go through what sure. it is and what that experience looked like for you? Yeah, I, I would say it's both physically and mentally debilitating. I think the scariest part about Lyme is the fact that people don't have an answer. So when you go to search through the traditional medical world, whether that's like your Lyme literate medical doctor, your LMD, or um, you know, your general practitioner, you typically get an answer that either A, um, there's no such thing as chronic Lyme disease and that you know your chronic symptoms may all be in your head, which is the most frustrating, or B, that there's no cure and that you can you know manage your symptoms and live day to day, but you'll never see the end of it. So the mental side, is extremely debilitating. So I was struggling to create a future, but I was diagnosed in 2017 after you know a massive head trauma. I was hanging out with some friends. We were up north in Canada in an area called Muskoka, and I dove off of a dock. I hit the bottom of the lake, and I fractured my C-spine. I tore my rectus capitis off my skull, which is the muscle that turns your head, and I needed 15 staples in my scalp. And you know, over time, I developed an instable spine. I was told I needed to possibly fuse my spine. And then other things started to happen. I, my shoulder started falling out. I actually tore my hip labrum at 20 years old and I was told I needed a new hip. And then I was diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease in 2017. And that didn't really hit me because I didn't know what it was. I was struggling with my head trauma and I thought that, you know, this kind of disease was secondary. It didn't, didn't hit me until I started to focus on it. So from 2017 to about 2020, I was very, very different than I am now. I was a very negative person. I went into a depressive cycle because the, the symptoms were crazy. I was under extreme neurological pain and something called brain fog, which I know a lot of people deal with these days from like overuse of phones and media and caffeine. But the brain fog was to a point of, I felt like I was a prisoner in my own head. I couldn't have thoughts for a very long time without like, I called it crashing. So in the Lyme world, they call them spoons. You only have a certain number of spoons, which are your energy sources per day, and you have to use them very wisely. So like doing the dishes, I would be exhausted after. And I know a lot of people understand what I'm saying because the Lyme community is massive now. There's probably tens of millions of people with Lyme, which is unfortunate. And I hope that my story can provide a little bit about, of hope. So beyond the physical pain, the mental symptoms were also very debilitating. So Lyme can actually attack you in multiple ways. It works in spirochets. So those are like little screws that screw into your tissues and they can get into your, into your brain. So a lot of people deal with depression, debilitating anxiety, and mine manifested that way for sure. So I started seeing my now wife, Lauren, when I was extremely ill. I don't know what she saw in me, but she saw something. And I remember buying her flowers one day and she came to the house and I was going to surprise her flat with flowers, but my anxiety overrode me to the point where I was like having a panic attack and shaking on the floor and not because it was a big situation, but just because of the nature of Lyme. So I had to tell her I got her flowers and blew the whole surprise, but people deal with, you know, these mental symptoms that they think that they can go to therapy for, which is great. Therapy is a great avenue, but they're actually physical manifestations of the disease itself. So I was dealing with extreme depression, anxiety, and then there's the social side. So I was in my final year of university. I was taking a business degree. I was a Dean's List honor student. I also played a lot of sports while I was at school. 
and I had to withdraw in my fourth and final year of university. So I had to watch all of my friends graduate, go on to get great careers, while I was stuck at home dealing with an illness that I, would, I thought was going to be with me forever. So at the same time of being physically ill, you know, mentally just like not able to, to participate in things, like being in a car, I couldn't be in a car because I would get so sick. Or even looking at a screen, I couldn't watch a show because of neurological implications of the illness. I just couldn't track things with my eyes. And then seeing my friends graduate, moving on, it was a lot to deal with. So those dealing with Lyme, it's not just the physical implications, but it's also the mental and then also financial. It's fiscal. So I was lucky when I was in a situation that my parents were, you know, I'm very fortunate that my parents were able to get me the right treatment, maybe not the right treatment, but all of the treatment that I went through, whereas a lot of people can't. It's not supported through insurance in the U.S. In Canada, there's actually no practitioners that deal with the continuance of Lyme. So the chronic part of Lyme, they won't deal with. They'll give you a three-week antibiotic prescription if that doesn't help which it doesn't unfortunately then you're stuck to deal with it so the Lyme was a huge part of my life and I'm happy to say today that I have no Lyme disease in my system so if you did blood tests or any other tests it would be untraceable because it's non-existent and I went through a long process to get better but my mission today is to provide hope through my story through my platform that connects you with over 300 awesome coaches that can get you better and just through my message, which is, it is possible. I think that, you know, lifestyle changes are the number one thing that we can control in our health and wellness. And whether that's physical, like going out and going for a run, getting some cardio, it boosts your, your mental capacity as well. You can feel better, it releases endorphins, and then that enables you to get out of a chronically stressed state, which allows you to heal. So the physical part, the mental part, I have an awesome meditation practice. I was never a spiritual person. I'm extremely spiritual now because I know the benefits of getting into that parasympathetic state and relaxing. And then the emotional side. So building an awesome network of people around you that care. So empathy is the driving force at my business where all of our coaches have gone through something, have overcome something, and that's why they coach. They're also all certified. We, we display that very proudly on their profiles but you'll always get someone that cares. So you can pick up your phone and call your coach or uh, message them on our platform and you'll always have an ear. And I find that that is something that is invaluable when you're really struggling. So I know I rambled, I talked about 80 different things, but that's, that's, where, I'm, that's where I'm coming from. That's what drove me to do what I do today. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll come into those later parts of your journey in just a moment, but I wanna go back to the diagnosis and the time that you spent dealing with Lyme. Yeah. How does it show up in your blood work exactly? You mentioned it's untraceable today. What's it look like when you get your blood tests done? Sure. And I'm curious about this because if, if there aren't too many practitioners, how do people know what to look out for if maybe yeah. even their doctor doesn't even know what to look out for? Right, so Lyme is now being clinically diagnosed, meaning that since the tests are, you know, if you get a Western blot test, which is the normal test that doctors will do to see if you have Lyme, that's an acute test. So that's like if you're bit by a tick or you come across it in another way and you like uh, come in contact with Borrelia burgdorferia, which is the bacteria of Lyme within the previous two weeks, it will show up on the Western blot test and potentially be able to be eradicated uh, out of your system with some, some antibiotics. But when it's more chronic, when you've had it for a decade, like myself, we're, we're, we think I did, or a couple years, the Western blot test is going to be negative. And the reason is, is that it's not looking for cytokines, um, which are the active part of the illness, but it's actually looking for the bacteria itself. And um, there's other tests out there that I did. So there's a really awesome panel in Germany that Armin Labs does that runs for, I think, like over 30 strains of Lyme. And they actually test for cytokines. So when I did my test in Canada, came back negative, and we then sent my blood to a bunch of places. I did a Cyrex panel in LA and in California, and they test for like food sensitivities, um, gut permeability, all this really cool stuff. So I found that I had leaky gut, which I think 99% of chronic illness patients do. So that can result in so many symptoms. So gut health is really, really important. But then Armin Labs was the number one lab I found out through my community for testing for Lyme. So my, my results came back positive. They also test for co-infections. So when you have Lyme disease, there's multiple different infections and viruses that come along with it. So that can be like Babesia, um, Bartonella, uh, Chlamydia. Um, there's, there's hundreds, but the Armin Labs test tests for them all. So the, I think the diagnosis is a very important process. 
But if you cannot afford an Armin Labs test, it's it's relatively expensive. I think it's over a thousand dollars just to test your blood, and, and no insurance is, is unfortunately going to cover that. A clinical diagnosis is is just as good. So if you have someone in your network, like a Lyme literate medical doctor or a general practitioner that understands how Lyme manifests now because it's pretty popular, the treatment process is the same. So not knowing if it's in your blood or not, um, if you have symptoms that manifest as Lyme, like I talked about extreme brain fog, fatigue, anger, depression, anxiety, pain, you know, the treatment process for that, like I think they call it um, chronic fatigue syndrome, is the same as Lyme. Got you. And how would you know that that's not just you being kind of crippled by your anxiety and your depression, but it's not yeah. necessarily Lyme disease? How does, can we tell the difference between those two things? That's a great question. So, I mean, when you struggle with depression, that manifests physically as well. So you'll have a lack of energy. You know, it's very similar. So the assumption that I, like, people that have Lyme disease, when I, like, if you're in my situation, um, you cannot physically work. The symptoms are beyond just depression. They manifest physically. Um, there's like neurosis stuff. So like I had um, nerve issues. Like I sometimes couldn't use my hands. Um, I would have partial paralysis at times. Something's definitely wrong physically. And it's it's really hard to put a finger on it. So Lyme's called the great mimicker. So it, it manifests as like, if you might think you have MS, you might think you have Parkinson's. Um, sometimes it manifests as like a facial paralysis. So you think you may have Bell's palsy. That being said, I always think that you know, a diagnosis is, is a great start, but for for people that want to get started on lifestyle changes, those changes can can start immediately. So if you want to, you know, take back control of your diet, remove inflammatory foods, get into a less stressed state through meditation and a spiritual practice, or start creating a network of people that care, you can do those no matter kind of what your diagnosis is, and it can help you dramatically off the bat. Yeah, that's really super helpful. And I think that just about anything can be helped for those lifestyle yeah. interventions as well. So whether you think you do or you think you don't, I think it's always a good idea to get started there. And it's definitely going to lead you to some improvements. And coming back to where you believe you are stemmed from, it was the head trauma. How did it develop from head trauma? And how are yeah. some other ways that people can encounter Lyme disease? Sure. So my hypothesis, like backed by like, doctors and years of um, going through this and, and similar cases of uh, people that have come to me is that the Lyme was dormant in my system. So I picked up the bacteria somewhere over the past decade, potentially a tick bite, potentially something else, not sure what it was. And the tra head trauma lowered my immunity to a point where the illness itself became active. So when people go into remission with Lyme, they call it remission. Sometimes it comes back because the disease can activate. With me, I no longer have any trace of it in my system because um, we did some crazy stuff that we can get into. I really want to help people, but it may seem a little bit out of out of whack with you know my my general purpose. But yeah, so the Lyme disease was dormant. The head trauma activated. A lot of trauma that activates Lyme is not physical. So people go through in a breakup, or the, one of their parents die, or um, a, a pet passes away, or they go through they, a loss of a job at work, and then they start seeing these physical manifestations of an illness. And they're like, how did this happen? It's because you lowered your immunity so drastically in a like short period of time that the virus, or sorry, the bacteria and viruses were able to become active. So many people could be living with it actively or passively in their system right now, but if their immunity is in a good place and it's not being activated, they can kind of go on and live a normal life or will they experience some form of symptoms maybe if they do get a little bit run down and they're unwell it's not necessarily traumatic both physically or mentally but it's just a like a common flu or cold and maybe it hits them harder is that the type of uh, experience that people can go through typically our, like if we're healthy individuals like like yourself and, and me now um even if we had a dormant version of some virus like we, we pick up viruses and and common colds and flus like and and bacteria no matter what throughout our day like when we communicate with people go to the grocery store pick up fruit you know we're picking up different bacteria but the goal is to have a strong enough immunity that those stay dormant and get flushed out don't don't cause us problems like we all know people that when the flu season comes around they get the flu and it's consistent but we know other people that have don't get sick ever you know there's different things that play into that blood type mindset is huge and you know like some people will say, oh, I never get sick and they truly believe it. And I, and I think that that plays a huge part. Um, and then other people just consistently get sick. So, you know, there's, there's different genetics, there's different body makeups, there's different, you know, belief systems. Um, 
but the you know the some people could die in their you know late 90s 100 year old and have it in their system dormant and it's never been activated because um, they've never had some sort of immunity disruptor that has caused them to be affected yeah that makes a lot of sense and that's where it comes back to like keeping your lifestyle variables in the best place possible so that even if you encounter something like this then nothing is going to activate or trigger it enough and it remains dormant or like you said it hopefully gets flushed out of your system as well and yeah. one more question before we go into the recovery side of things what did that experience look like when you went through that dive in canada and that lake and yeah i'm imagining it's like a near-death experience no yeah you know it, it was more of an embarrassment for me um I was super embarrassed. Look, like I, I didn't know how bad the trauma was until weeks later. Like my head felt fine. I, I, I obviously, I, I went in an ambulance to the hospital, got some staples in my scalp. They did a CT scan, said nothing was wrong. Said I was very lucky. Um, but it wasn't until weeks later that I started having s symptoms manifest. So, at the time, I was very embarrassed, was surrounded by tons of people. I just wanted to get out of there and, and not make a scene. Far, like after the fact, like a few weeks later. Um, I tried to hide my pain. I was working in management capital. I was working for um, a big finance company and the numbers on the screen just kept getting smaller and smaller. And by the time I was like, it was an internship. So the, by, by the time I went back to university, I was in extreme pain. My headaches, you know, were manifesting as like these squeezing, almost like an elastic band around my entire head. I had trouble sleeping at night. Um, I couldn't turn my head left and right. And I was still in, and very embarrassed at the time. And so I didn't really speak up until exam season came around uh, the first semester of my final year of university. And I couldn't keep up. I was in such a bad state now mentally and physically that I actually dropped out without kind of letting anybody know what, what I was really dealing with. And um, my housemates, who were my best friends at the time, didn't even know. I kind of told them that I dropped out and it was not in character with me and again I was a, a dean's list honor student that did really well and I remember like when my parents were traveling abroad and I just I went home and we had to start dealing with it I had a lot of trauma uncovered I had a, a, I was now living like a really poor lifestyle like at university I picked up really bad habits of like partying and drinking all the time and um letting myself like eat whatever I want like I didn't know nutrition at all I had, I had no no concept I was like, overworking my body I was in the gym seven days a week lifting extremely heavy weights I was um every part of my body hurt and then I was dealing with these headaches and other things so yeah it was more of an embarrassed situation than I guess an emergency at the time but it became an emergency yeah and it's crazy how much you covered up those very real symptoms and didn't explain to anyone just for the sake of hiding the embarrassment, right? Like I'm yeah. sure if you go back and was able to talk to the Jordan then, he probably would have told people immediately and try to just get over the embarrassment to get some treatment to get his life back in check and back in order as well. And it's amazing the things that we do to kind of hide these things as well. So I hope that that encourages someone who maybe is going through something that they're maybe feeling a little bit ashamed about, et cetera, to open up and try and get the help that they need as well. So Absolutely. you mentioned earlier, during the process of being deep with Lyme's disease that, you know, things like washing the dishes, for example, was extremely exhausting as well. So how do you get from that stage where daily tasks and anything that requires a remote bar of effort is relatively debilitating to a stage where you are fully recovered? What does that process look like? And where did you get started? Talk to us about those crazy things you said. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I did, I was working with a, a chiropractor at the time for my neck, which ended up not being exactly what I needed um, because at the time we didn't know it was like a, a compression fracture and I didn't know I'd torn my rectus capitis off my skull. But he was a very intelligent guy. So he said, in order for us to start working on your neck properly, there's tons of inflammation here. We're going to have to change your diet. So I didn't know any, I didn't know what the term gluten meant at the time, but we removed everything from gluten, dairy, inflammatory oils. And I took it so seriously that I just went to a whole foods diet. And what that was, was like organic fruits and vegetables and grass-fed meat products and no sugar no no caffeine no inflammatory like I went pretty nuts and um head first into that and I saw some good benefits but at the same time it wasn't wasn't great like I started to feel a little bit better I noticed like 
like if anything my body composition was changing like i, I wasn't working out because i physically couldn't but somehow i looked stronger that was really early on so the first thing i did was diet the second thing i did was not the right thing but i had a um, very massive sinus surgery because um i had an, an infection and now i know that manifested from you know my poor immunity lack of care of my body the lyme disease etc um, but i had a, a massive sinus surgery they removed like an infection from my frontal sinus and then four weeks later i actually had an artery rupture above my right eye because of the surgery and that was another emergency surgery so that's my first near my first or second near-death experience was my artery rupturing i had a faucet of blood running out of my nose my mouth and it was extremely serious i that was another wake-up call so that's the first thing i did and then right after that i got into some iv stuff so not antibiotics but vitamins and minerals in the form of an IV. So I started doing that daily at a clinic um, near my family. And I think that helped a bit. Um, but at the same time, supplements are supplements for a reason. The name suggests that they're some supplementing something else. That's not the, that's not a cure. So I was kind of depending that the supplements would, would help me. And they did, they did a good job. But then I started some more crazy things. I did something called HBOT therapy, which is um, hyperbaric oxygen chamber so you go in this um, chamber they pressurize it and supposedly the benefits are that the oxygen particles can go to different parts of your body and promote healing so i did about 40 treatments i think that that was a really good start for me and that was like one of the lifestyle changes it was like okay so now i'm starting to see some more natural healing and it was like opening my mind up but i was a chronically negative person i was so against it at the time like i was like i hate doing h bot i i wish i like i could eat whatever i wanted all of my meals were ordered from a company and delivered to my door with like like bait like it was like salmon and vegetables or like chicken and vegetables or it was like very very minimal and i was, I was super angry <laughs> which didn't help so we did the h bot to start and then with my neck recovery we we're doing like gymnastics and i think that really and it's crazy so like my chiropractor was an awesome guy. Maybe the, the actual adjustments of my neck weren't right, but he put me in touch with these amazing people. So I started doing gymnastics and just by doing some jumps and like twists and we ended up like, I ended up like videos of me doing like back flips and front flips and 360 pins um, with my coach, the brain, the neuro neurological implications was that I was retraining some of the synapses and neural networks in my brain. So I was starting to really feel better. So when I started doing gymnastics, I started thinking, okay, more lifestyle changes, that's great. And then, you know, I started getting worse again. I went in this little rut, got angry, you know, it's really nonlinear. And then I started seeing what I call my witch doctor. So I, I kind of skipped some things. I actually had a testicle surgery because I um, was misdiagnosed with a varicose vein when it was actually an infection again. Um, but then after the surgery, there was no way for blood flow to, anyways, long story, but I was put on ciproflaxin, which is a really, really, really strong antibiotic. And I tore out my hip labrum in gymnastics because the antibiotic weakens your tissues. So at 20 years old, I was told I needed a new hip. And at that point I went into a really, really sad, depressed state and I didn't want to do it. So my dad found this place in Fort Myers, Florida, where they were doing PRP injections, so platelet-rich plasma. So they take your blood out, they spin it, and they re-inject it. And at this time, they're still telling me I need to fuse my spine and all this crazy stuff. But I started, I, I did 15 rounds of injections in my hip. And by the time that was done, so that was over like a four-month period, I'm still kind of doing other things. My hip was perfectly healthy again. I didn't need surgery. So I'm starting to see some of these like more natural modalities. That's not really natural. It's still kind of almost surgical but they're working so that was phase one and then I started seeing my witch doctor at the same time so somebody up the street from me I was in a really bad place I was I was honestly suicidal at this point um, she had overcome Lyme and I thought it was impossible at the time so my dad knew her dad and she called me and she told me she was working you know like 22 hours a day now in Hollywood she's living her dream life she has all of her energy back and I just was in disbelief but she connected me to her practitioner in Detroit who is now what I call my witch doctor. So she used a process called RIFE, which is a frequency healing modality where you kind of have a frequency generator that generates radio frequencies. You put your feet in a, in a foot bath and you run it um, and the water turns brown. It iodizes. 
Um, but the, the theory behind this so that we can kind of get around the, the witchcraft of it is that every single thing in the world resonates at its own frequency. And if we're able to map that and resonate at the same frequency, we can dissolve it. So for example, if I had a wine glass and we played a certain pitch and it resonated at the same pitch as the wine glass, we could shatter it. So the theory with this frequency healing was that we could shatter the Lyme disease and it's biofilm that impacts it in, in my system with resonance and then just flush it out through my system. And again, I was so angry. I was like, I don't want to do this soda press. But when she ran her resonance test on me and I did just done all my blood work, she came back with almost the exact results of my blood work without having to do blood work. So she knew all of the Lyme disease that was in my system, all of the co-infections, and she had a list of about like 15 more. And we were, I was like, okay, this is a little creepy, but this worked for the person up the street. Let's give it a shot. So every single month I'd fly to Detroit, she'd scan me with a resonance machine. I'd put my hand on this piece of metal. It would send frequencies into the metal. If it absorbed into my body, that means I had it. If it went back to the machine, it meant it wasn't. So it'd sit there for two hours every month, get a new list of frequencies, and then it would program it into the machine that I'd take home. And I'd run this frequency machine five days a week. So for the first three months that I did it, I got extremely sick. And ironically, that was the first time I started to be happy because in the Lyme community, we have what's called a Herxheimer reaction, which means that when you kill off Lyme, your body reacts very poorly because your organs have to deal with the discarded Lyme disease. So like your liver and kidneys are working overtime because they're getting rid of this stuff. So I knew that I was Herxing so that something was, you know, working. At the same time, I was doing PRP in my hip and now gone to PRP in my neck. I was doing stem cell injections in my neck now too. So they were drilling into my shin, extracting stem cells and putting it back into my neck. And at the end, I was doing this witchcraft Rife machine. So within about eight months and eight times of going to Detroit and probably 20 times of going to Fort Myers, I didn't have Lyme disease in my system anymore. And it was this crazy thing. So a lot of people attribute it to my, my Rife machine, but it was more than that. It was like my practitioner that programmed the Rife. So I had to scan myself very frequently because when you kill Lyme, co-infections are released and you're, you know, you're, the makeup of the illness in your body completely changes. I had changed my diet. I had, was eating nothing inflammatory. I was now working with a meditation coach. I was getting in because of Lauren. She said, you need to stop being stressed. She realized that my wife, Lauren, she's like, you are so stressed and you're trying to heal. Your body is like, like this, like, you're like, I need to heal. So I needed to release. So I was working with a meditation coach. I was meditating daily. Um, my nutrition, I was now spiritual. I was connecting with a spiritual coach to, you know, to think about my inner child and how my, my past was working. And at the same time, I was doing this like crazy witchcraft stuff with the frequencies and I got better. And then I started supplementing, um, learning more about nutrition. I got back into working out. I got my body to a place where I was really proud of it. And I became a licensed personal trainer and I, I started seeing personal training clients. And I realized that that's not what I wanted to be. Like I wanted a more holistic approach and not saying that some people in personal training don't want it, but the people that I were seeing were extremely aesthetic based. They wanted, you know, biceps and abs. And, um, I thought that, you know, I wanted to deal with the chronically ill community. So I went back to school. I got my business degree again. I finished it. And then I got certified as a health and life coach, uh, through another program. And I started seeing chronic Lyme disease patients. And I got about a half dozen people through lifestyle changes alone, not, not even the, the rife machine witchcraft that I was doing to feel so much better. And, um, those six people say that not, they got 80% better. And I thought that was incredible because that is something that we just did through lifestyle changes. So I thought on a massive scale, there's got to be more people doing what I'm doing. And I realized that there's 100,000 registered health and life coaches in the U.S. alone. And 80% of them are out of work. So when they pay the 10K or the 5K to get their, their certification, the only person winning is the certifying body. Because these people now struggle to create a business. It's expensive to create a website. It's expensive to have a hosting service. And, you know, it's, you know, they don't have business degrees. So it's really hard to go out there and build a business that you're actually making an impact and earning income. So my main goal was to create this platform for these coaches where it was free to sign up and we worked on a transaction basis. And we built the funnel so that the clients on the platform also had the most easy access to trusted and vetted coaches. So kind of my story getting into the business side. But, um, yeah, we don't do the, well, maybe some of the coaches... We'll talk about the, the crazy methodologies that use in, in treatment, but um, 
we're all about lifestyle changes that you can do at home. That's what we preach. Yeah, and I think that what you mentioned and what you finished on them was really powerful for anyone who's thinking, okay, well, I don't have the crazy witch doctor. Yeah. I don't think I can fly to Detroit anytime soon. So it's great to hear that you were able to help people solve their issues by 80% just through lifestyle interventions more so than anything. So people could start that today. And just to run them through very, very clearly so people could take that away, it was a anti-inflammatory diet. So pretty much going down to nutritionally complete whole foods. And exactly. then a lot of it was what was the other type of things you did the meditation did the breath work what were yeah. the other things that you implemented with yourself and with your clients as well yeah like um daily exercise not strenuous so i had things that are called like hard tasks and soft tasks so like the hardening stuff was like exercise sauna you know if they wanted to do a cold plunge or, or that sort of thing those were stress stress inducing activities and then we had the soft stuff which was like the meditation the um connecting with nature the being with family building relationships and I think that, you know, we also have like the nutrition and, and mindset part, but those are equally as important. And if we do too many stress inducing things like exercise and sauna and treatment, and we forget about the stress releasing things like the restful stuff, we can get into another chronically stressed environment where we can't thrive. So, you know, like a lot of people when they're doing treatment, they want to go, go, go to kill the disease and get better. But it's almost counterintuitive that you need to relax into it. And, and I always say like letting go is the most counterintuitive thing in the world because it's not giving up. Giving up and letting go are two completely separate things. Letting go is looking at your life and saying, Here's a, here are the factors that I can't control. Here are the factors that I can. I'm not going to think about these. I'm only going to think about what I can control. And, you know, giving up is like, you know, it's too hard. I'm almost a bit comfortable where I am. I'm still kind of sick, but I'm, I'm comfortable, so I'm not going to do it. So... I always help my clients let go. So we create a list of things that we're stressing them out. We ask like, do we have control here? And, you know, and deep down they know that they didn't. And over time that list um, would be bigger because they realize even the stuff they thought they can control was not controllable. Like I can control my exercise. Well, maybe you don't feel good today or maybe you're doing a walk for your exercise and it's raining outside. It's like you can control the intent towards the exercise like that you want to, but maybe the you know, the result isn't there. So letting go is really important. And then nutrition. So every one of my clients, you know, has to go through some sort of, I don't like the word restrictive, but, you know, elimination diet where we look at what we're eating, why we eat it. You know, a lot of us use sugar as a drug. It's a coping mechanism and we don't really crave the sugar. We crave, you know, that high we get from it, but it comes with a crash. So, you know, that, that, you know, it's almost self-sabotage when we, we have a diet that's full of processed foods and um, things that, you know, we love to taste but hate to feel. So always going for the long-term benefit through your diet. Like, you know that having, you know, a nice macro bowl, maybe it's like brown rice with some vegetables, a nice protein source, some greens. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the more clean you can go, the more closer to nature, the better you're going to feel with anything. So um, that's an awesome approach. And then the mindset. I think mindset is, is 80%. I, I now think it might be 90% of the battle. So if you, if you go into something thinking it's not going to work like I did for half a decade, it's not going to work, right? Like you will find ways to not make it work. It's like our reticular activating system. And when you buy a new car, like if you, buy, you bought a new Chevrolet, you're going to see it everywhere. It's just because that's what we're seeing now. It's always been there. But it's what we're seeing now. So if you're looking for something to fail, if you're looking for something to not work, you're going to see all the ways it's not going to work. But if you're looking for the way that it's going to succeed, and maybe there's only one, you're only going to see the one way it's going to succeed. And working on our mindset and having a consistent practice, it's like anything. If, you're, if you want to build your biceps, you don't go to the gym once and do a curl, right? Like it's, it's consistent work. It's like over a period of six to nine months. So with your mindset, it's the same thing building a consistent journaling practice, meditation practice, consulting practice, talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, going through um, what you're struggling with. It, how can we work through this in a proactive manner? And that's where coaching comes in. So there's lots of ways to do it, but having someone in your back pocket, like a coach or a friend or a counselor or a therapist, it doesn't matter who it is, is always a good idea. Yeah, I think it's so nice to be able to run that question against someone and run that approach with someone who's got your back right and it's yeah. not just your ideas or your thought processes because of your as you mentioned dealing with all those beliefs and those narratives like 
I would say that, and maybe this is a question for you to answer as you've probably got these reflections now, is that do you think that maybe the nutrition would have been more helpful, all these other things would have been more helpful if you weren't so angry and frustrated about the process? Absolutely. And like one, one side of the anger and frustration is it throws you into that stress state. You, you can't heal when your blood is all rushing to your extremities because you're, you're like in fight or flight, your, your brain doesn't know if it's real or fake. So it's like, we're ready to go, we're leaving. So the anger put me in there, but it's also that belief system that I am getting better. I know, and then you know what happened to my, like my belief system was not natural. It's like, I met my, <laughs> my witch doctor, I like calling her that. I met um, Kyle and she said that she has a hundred percent success rate with her patients. And I was like, you know, maybe that was the, the thing that got me over the edge because now that was the moment I remember. That was the moment I let go. It was like, okay, so now it's on her because she said she's got this. So I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna let, I'm gonna believe in her. And it, and it did work. Um, but I also think, you know, the one key ingredient that I was missing is purpose. So when I met Lauren, um, I've never been a spiritual person. She helped me get there. But the one vision I consistently had was throwing a ball with my son. And this is something that's completely real. Like I was extremely sick. And I remembered thinking like, if I stay sick, one, I don't think I'll ever get to be a father. And two, like this vision of me being active and participating in my son's life isn't going to come to fruition. So like, that's the one thing, like it was leverage. It was the thing that was like, when I wanted to quit, I, I remembered this vision that, you know, I can, I can make this happen. So when things were down, when I was out, I kept remembering this and, you know, and now I am a father, like my son, Bo is nine weeks old. I'm, I've been married for over two, two years. And I think that we can manifest if that's another conversation we want to have is that, um, you know, a lot of us, like, I think the great majority don't plan our future. Um, we spend more time planning a two week vacation than we do our life. And that's a really tough thing to uncover. And it's a really sad truth. But when I realized that, like I have journals, from years ago and, I, and if we go through them like most things happen when you set an intention and you go after it it's achievable but if you're just living day to day and um, putting out fires than your life or you know doing the small tasks and not having a greater vision you know what, what's going to happen your life is dictated by external forces but if you have a greater vision of what you want to accomplish and you can see the path then everything you do you weigh it against your greater vision so like if my greater vision was to become Mr. Olympia or like compete in bodybuilding and I'm about to have like a milkshake or a, um, you know, a box of Oreos, um, I'm more likely not to not going to do that because I realized my greater vision of the bodybuilding championship. I know that's like a super abstract vision, but it's the same with health. So if you want to overcome chronic illness and your goal is to be a father like mine was, it was just a natural thing that happened through a vision everything I did, I weighed against that vision subconsciously, whether it was conscious or not, doesn't matter. It's that every single thing I did, if I was looking at my diet and I wanted to quit and I wanted to just dive into a bag of chips, it's fine. You can have balance. But like, if I wanted to like, just quit altogether, I looked at that vision. I was like, that's, that's not, that's not going to get me there. So there's some things that happen naturally that we can induce through practice, but yeah, that, that's something else. Yeah, I love all those points you mentioned, especially the one where people will spend longer planning their two-week vacation than their next 10 years of their life. And it's yeah. so true and it's unbelievable. Like, think about that trip that you planned a few years ago. Think about the best vacation you ever went on and how much planning went into that. You booked the flights eight months out. You had your agenda down to a T. And then think about how many times you've done that in your own life. And it's, it's quite mind-blowing as well. And I also love the piece on the where you want to go, having that big vision, having that intention of heading in the right direction and then congruency falls into place as you mentioned it was a bit of an abstract goal with mr olympia but like you said if you have that vision and the reality is is to you and i like someone's weight loss goal someone being completely healthy might be what mr olympia is to us right it doesn't matter yeah. what the mountaintop is it's just about having that mountaintop and then recognizing okay if you don't have a mountaintop then eating the oreos or whatever doesn't seem to make too much of a difference there's no cost to that but when you have that mountaintop and you literally see that every step that you take is either towards the goal or obviously, like we said, there's balance, there's taking side steps and everything. But if we're being very, very black and white, it's towards the goal or it's against the goal. It's so much easier to run it through that decision making process and make the right decisions for your goals as well. So, yeah, I really, really like that piece. And what I want to transition onto now is the things that you're doing with Hatchpath. Like I'm really interested about the 
wellness professionals and getting them on a platform because you mentioned there's like a hundred thousand licensed professionals right yeah and i speak to so many of them as well i speak to health and fitness coaches i speak to life coaches all day long and what i want to understand is when you are looking for a wellness professional to go on your platform what exactly are you looking for because of right now Actually, I'm going to give you a story, and this is why I love sure. your concept so much. Is when I was a personal trainer, when I first started my career, it was literally 10 years ago, I was on the floor with 14 other dudes and maybe two women at the time. It was personal training. And there was this guy who was incredibly, incredibly talented. He was one of the best trainers there, like biomechanically speaking. Like he knew his stuff and he was a very good coach. And then there was another guy who was really not that great whatsoever, but he was incredibly optimistic. He was very talkative. He was super extroverted as well. The extroverted guy who wasn't that good of a coach, full books. I think he still literally works in the same gym to this day, 10 years later. The other guy, I don't think he even does personal training anymore. And this is why I like your platform in the sense of like, there are a lot of good coaches out there. They just don't know how to market themselves. And unfortunately, because they're not marketers, they don't actually, they're not able to succeed in a career in which the industry actually genuinely needs them. So when it comes to your platform, are you looking for people who are amazing marketers and just want to make business? Or are you looking for, I'm getting a sense of the answer here, but are you looking for those people who are maybe not able to quite market themselves, but have a lot to offer? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously um, the number, the second option there, and, and the reason being like our, our vetting process is, is pretty serious, but really easy for a coach. Like you, you sign up with our form, you submit your certifications, which are optional, by the way. We have uncertified coaches because it's an unregulated industry leading with empathy. Like we have some spiritual coaches that like do things that are uncertifiable. So, you know, this one-to-one -one vetting process is really important, but you can, you can submit all your certifications. You tell us a story about who you are. And the number one thing we're looking for is a positive approach and empathy. Like, are you a coach because you don't want a nine to five job and, and you think this is the way out? Or are you a coach because you've overcome something or you know something that help, can help other people overcome and your passion and your drive won't let them quit and you know that there's a way out. So when we have this little talk, like I can have this talk with you, Ellie, I can see it. Um, it's pretty clear. Like you can see someone leading with empathy. We have some questions that pulls that out. But other than that, um, yeah, all of our, you know, I think over 90% of our coaches are certified. We show that with a little blue check on our uh, on our platform, but we also have social proof tools. So every time someone has a session with one of our coaches on our platform, they have to leave a rating and review. So the next person understands what they're getting into. So, you know, there's a, you know, we can, uh, we have regular company audits. So we go through the programs on our platform. Um, our admin team, you know, works with our coaches in a manner that makes sure that everybody has something valuable to offer. And we do monthly masterclasses for our coaches. So on the marketing side, if you're not a great marketer, recently we just brought in a top business coach literally yesterday and we had a free masterclass for our coaches. And every single month we try to do that on both the coach and the client side. So outside of the one-to-one -one services, we're building a, a community and an ecosystem that cares and has empathy. So, I mean, we, we charge no subscription fee. So that's another benefit for coaches. Like I, I understand, like I think the average cost in US dollars was like $1,400 a month for a coach to run their business with like website development, website hosting, um, scheduling, um, like invoicing and then paying your taxes and having an account. So coming to Hatchpath, we do all of that for a 20% transaction fee. So only when we get you a paying client, you pay us and it happens automatically. But we have our scheduling, our payment processing, you get your tax information at the end of the year. We have our video conferencing, messaging portal. Um, you can create all your programs on our platform. And my goal is for it to act as your, your website, your place where you offer your services in an easy and efficient manner. So yeah, on the coaching side, it's great. But on the client side, I actually think we do even better. So, you know, clients, the main thing that we see them dealing with is overwhelm. So when you're looking for a coach, every coach has a website, you know, it's, it's a lot of work and using Google, Google doesn't do a great job of showing you coaches. So if you're searching for something like chronic Lyme disease, you're going to get hits from like WebMD, some, some other information, but you know, we're not showing the people that can, can help you in a capacity of the empathy and side by side. So with our platform, if you just come on as a client, again, hundred percent free to join and, you know, use our search tools, you'll find people immediately that fit your needs. And within a glance, you can see, okay, Jordan, five stars, hundred and something sessions. And he leads with X, Y, Z. This is his package. It has nine sessions. You can see all of this stuff. Um, so we make it extremely easy for 
the consumer, the client, the person in need to make a decision with the people that they work with. And how on a long-term frame with your business model, are you going to make sure that the cream doesn't rise to the top and all the new coaches that come in don't kind of get a look at? Because obviously if it's done on a basis of like, okay, Jordan's got a thousand five-star reviews because yeah. he's been on the platform from the very beginning. As much as that's good for you guys as well, because you want valuable and loyal coaches sure. and people who deliver high quality sessions. But then if I'm a coach and maybe I'm not even going to start for the next five years, I'm like, how am I going to go up against Jordan? He's going to be Absolutely. getting all of the clients. And that's not how our, our sorting works. So, you know, you can choose to sort by top rated and such, but we don't even display ratings and reviews until you enter into the coach specific pages. So on all of the explore pages where you see information, I actually think that the ratings and reviews are a deterrent to book because you know, that's exactly right. When you have a, a ratings platform, the cream rises to the top and one person may not be the best person is getting all of them, uh, the action. So we display certain metrics that we think are valuable. We display um, like, like simple things, like a summary of what the program is. You can see the coach bio. You can see the name of the program. Uh, you can see the amount of sessions. Some people want a single session. Some people want multiple. They want to work with the coach on a consistent basis and different metrics that don't revolve around usage. But once you get into the coach's page, you can see those. So you can see like he's at X amount of sessions. This is many reviews. Um, this is his top program, but um, not right away. So if you're a new coach that's coming to our platform, that's something that we actually train you in. So when you come on, we have our master classes about how to appear on our platform in an awesome and professional way to deliver your best quality services. Um, we rotate through coaches on our landing page through an API. So when people refresh the page, you're seeing a great new batch of coaches and it's based on, you know, the consumer's interest through different end things like cookies and fun internet stuff like that. But yeah, I think that there's, it's equal opportunity, but also driven by quality. So we vet all of the coaches, obviously, and then you still have these, this rating process because we make sure that if you drop below, you know, a four star rating out of five, which is pretty high, we have another interview with you. Or if you get a review that's interesting, like below a 2.5, that gets submitted to us and we get to review it and understand why. So we do want to maintain the quality on the platform, but again, it's like a balancing act between having the best and brightest coaches and enabling a fair opportunity. Yeah, I like it. It's a nice balance. And I'm interested, what happens when you get someone who thinks I'm going to be an awesome fit with this coach, I sign up with them and it's just not a fit because if coaching is a very, very kind of delicate relationship and most yeah. people pick their coaches based on who they think they might get on with the most or probably result social proof is a big one as well but they're like is this my type of person especially when it comes to working with something like your health right it really needs to be a relationship it can't just be a here's your training plan here's your nutrition plan you know go do this and come back to me it's a very delicate relationship right absolutely yeah so that's a great question so we have two options for payment plans so you can pay as you go which means that when you do join let's say it's a 12 session program over 12 weeks um, you're in a contract for those 12 weeks with the coach, but if there's an extenuating circumstance, you can cancel. So if you get into session three and you're like, okay, this is no longer for me, you can cancel. It submits to our admin team. We review your, your cancellation request and we approve it based on certain circumstances. So if you're like saying that coach isn't the right fit, I'm not enjoying it, a hundred percent. Um, the sessions that you facilitated prior have been paid for and the coach receives them income, but the upcoming sessions are no longer liable for you. You don't have to continue. So um, we make it extremely easy. Our admin team is always available to ask questions, but that's a great question. The other option, if you pay all up front, um, we do have a refund process. So let's say that you're on session three, but you've paid for the entire program. The three sessions are now paid for. You are refunded for the remaining part of the program. So there's two different processes, same result. Yeah, and I can imagine that you've got to bear in mind the individual circumstances because if someone just goes, ah, uh, this is too hard, it's not yeah. necessarily fair on the coach. And maybe there's an opportunity to try and find an intervention of like, okay, well, maybe I can scale back this process. Because I find that when most people start a coaching program, they're highly motivated and they have unrealistic expectations of what right. they can commit to on a long-term basis. Like realistically, they'll tell me I can commit to 20 training sessions per week and I can eat clean every single day. And then you get to week four and it's like, well, maybe that didn't work out quite as I wanted to. So I imagine it's very down to the certain situation and the context of that program and that individual client circumstance that they're going through, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's pretty clear what the, the offering is when, when you get into it. We have warnings across the, not warnings, but little notes across the way about um, basically, are you sure by committing to, you know, this program, you're joining a contract for the next 12 weeks and, you know, extenuating circumstances are the way that we will, you know, work on. So and also another thing we do is free discovery calls. Um, all coaches have the option to offer a free discovery call. So if you're not sure you want to work with a coach, you can book a free discovery call on our platform, 100% free, and meet them, understand their offering, and then go from there. And I understand that that's not a sure win. So like we obviously have the cancellation, but that, that's another way to kind of ensure success. Mm. And from a purely business model perspective, how do you intend to be the go-to place when someone thinks, I want a coach, I'm going to go directly to Hatch Path. How are you going to get there? Because of, I think that something needs to exist like that. Because as far, like, even when I look for a health and fitness coach or any type of coach, I have a tough job doing it. Like I'm scrolling through Instagram page after Instagram page. Websites aren't really a thing anymore. You don't really know what you can trust. Like I've had situations where I think a clo- like a coach's content on social media is actually better than their coaching program which blows my mind to be completely honest but it's been a situation that i've genuinely gone through very recently as well and i think the other company that i think has done a good job of this is better help i don't know if you've, they you've probably come across them i'm yeah, sure better, better help they've done a good job of being yeah they like okay well i'm not sure where to find my therapist my psychologist etc so i'm just going to go to this place that i've heard of and hopefully they can match me up with the right fit you know obviously that you know, like as we said, uh, the right fit is a very, very subjective thing, so it can always be challenging. But I feel like they've done a good job in the mental health space. So, how are you planning to kind of do your own thing, but almost replicate what they've done when it comes to the health and wellness space? Sure. So we have a two pronged approach. So we relaunched relatively recently. So as of three weeks ago, our platform is now up and running for bookings, um, and we're now doing our you know PR, media, and corporate approach. So we brought on an amazing PR team. So just like you see, better help. Like I'm doing this conversation with you. Um, we're working with an amazing team that can, you know, get us on the morning shows, um, into the right news outlets and media outlets, work with the right people. So that's prong one. And then we brought on a nice um, sales team in our in our business model that we work with corporations. So my main goal is to help the people that need help. And we realize that sometimes they're not the payers because sometimes it's, you know, out of budget. So with the corporate route, we can help more people that need the right services um, and enable a, and cultivate a community within the corporation. So the corporate wellness spend is something that a lot of large corporations have, and it's mainly typically focused towards mental health and well-being. And we know that 95% of serotonin begins in the gut. So, you know, a lot of mental health actually begins with our physical health. So nutrition, mindset, physical activity, um, therapy is a great outlet, but our goal is to look more holistically. So we even have spiritual health relationship coaches. So our corporate approach is something that I'm really proud of and, and can help a lot of people. But again, we're brand new. So we're on this sprint where um, just trying to build as much awareness as possible, understand consumer feedback and make an impact because we're an impact driven business. I started this out of my own journey. All of our coaches coach out of empathy and you know the main goal is to help as many people as possible and we're still figuring out the best way to do that yeah i really do hope you succeed to be honest because i believe in the power of coaching and i think that something's needed like this has been a big need for a long time and especially as the market becomes even more i don't want to use the word saturated because the market is never really saturated it's great to have options but with more and more people become qualified every single day and less and less people and also from a coaching perspective as well i've been a coach in the past where i've not been able to really focus on the enjoyment and fulfillment of coaching because i've been worried about paying my bills right and i think a lot of coaches go through that stage of like there's dips in your career and in the early stages of mine it was like okay well i'm super happy because i've got this client and i you know i got into this to change lives but now I'm kind of thinking I've got that gym rent to pay or, you know, I've got my home rent yeah. to pay or whatever it might be that you're then focusing more on the income than you are actually the reason you got into this industry in the first place. So I think if someone can go to a platform where they know they're going to find someone that should be a fit of theirs and the client from the perspective of the person who wants the coach and the coach that's also a client of yours gets a win-win scenario then I yeah. think it can only work out for the best from that perspective and kind of just like sift through a lot of kind of the junk in the industry as well which exists let's be true here and as you get to the roots of 
what really, really good and ethical coaching can be. Absolutely. And I like what you said about like, kind of like the junk, because we do vet the process. Like if a coach applies and we ask them why they're a coach and they're like an 18, 19 year old fresh out of school and they don't want to pursue a career, they just want to be a coach. Sometimes that can work. Sometimes, you know, more than, you know, you know, coaching is like a hand up, hand down approach. If you're just one step ahead of somebody, sometimes you can help someone that's one step behind. But we want coaches to lead with empathy. So our vetting process is crucial to us, making sure that we have the right coaches on our platform, building, fostering a community. So you're right. I really, I really hope we succeed too. And I'll do everything in my power to make that happen. Yeah. And I'm just grateful to be able to talk to people like yourself. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Jordan, this has been a super insightful conversation. And yeah, I'm really keen to keep up with the work that you're doing as well. And I want to ask you a couple of final questions. And sure. the first, you've kind of covered this, but I want to get it in a sentence and a leaving message is what impact do you want to have on the world with the work that you do? The main impact is hope. I want to be a driving factor and giving people hope through results. So if you come to our platform and you see success stories of someone that was in your position and is no longer in your position, we're giving you hope and then the systems to succeed. I love that. And where's the best place for people to find you, to discover Hatchpath? Where can we send people? Sure. You can find me personally on Instagram, just Jordan Dunnan. And then Hatchpath is simply www.hatchpath.io, which is H-A-T-C-H, path, P-A-T-H. And the reason that we named it Hatchpath is because, you know, we got through a lot of legal liability. We were originally called The Well Nest, which I was very proud of coming up with that name. But Hatchpath means birthing your new journey. So I believe that when you start a coaching practice, you're actually changing your identity. So you're becoming a new person. And that's the, the most crucial part to, you know, any growth is leaving, you know, that old person behind and understanding that I can become anything I want to be. So Hatchpath just means the birth of your new journey. I love it. And for the listeners listening today, it's not Hatchpatch, Hatchpath. Remember that's that right. Yes. <laughs> We're going to be doing some uh, awesome branding that we understand that, but that's something that we struggle with too. So brand identity is key. So thank you for bringing that up. Jordan, it's been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for your time today, buddy. Thank you so much, Elliot. It was great talking to you.